particularly when you are living in a, uh, a fallen age, which is the kind of age we're living in, it is at that time very necessary for us to see things for what they shall be, particularly in a fallen age. Because everything that's happening in the, and that's the kind of age we're living in, which is why I say that. Because everything that's happening in this present age seems to contradict everything we know to be true of what God has said shall be. See? Mm -hmm. Everything he said, it will, how things will turn out, it does not look that way. It doesn't look that way. And so we need to remind ourselves of how things shall be. Mm -hmm. How will they end up? So I want to do that this morning, just show you some things. These are things that are set in stone. This, isn't, this might happen. These are things that will be things that will happen. For example, in Matthew 24, 29 and 30, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I mean, we live in a time where Jesus has uh, become a kind of a byword in the church, but he's not respected for who he is. He's not really seen as king of kings and lord of lords. People can easily shuffle off the name of Jesus or even use it in vain. Speak against his name, and some even profess that he doesn't exist, amazingly. But all this hasn't changed at all whom God has set in his holy hill. He has set his king, see? So the exhortation goes out to all these arrogant men that, Kiss the sun. See, this is what shall be. You can't be overly discouraged by the fact that people don't honor Christ, although this impacts upon us. This is a burden. But it won't always be that way. Those who are jealous for the name of Jesus to be glorified, believe me, God's not going to try to glorify his son. <laughs> he is going to glorify him. See, and this is what shall be. You see the benefit of serving Christ now. Then here's another one. Ephesians chapter two. These are all things that shall be. Ephesians chapter two. A word to all those whom God has shed His love on and has saved them. He tells us, beginning in the fifth verse, when we were dead in sins, He hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That. In the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace. In his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's God's intent. Right. See, if you were living back in this day when Israel had been smitten by the living God, it certainly wouldn't have appeared that his intention was to bless all the families of the world through Abraham. Israel was in shambles. It would not have appeared that way at all, but that was still God's intention. Amen. But in this kind of a time where God is smiting, you can have like a lopsided view of God. You're going to get a lopsided view of God. Well, you can see, well, definitely God, he's one that disciplines. He's definitely a wrathful God. That's what we're dealing with the holy God because he hasn't put up with their sins. And this concept of God's kindness and goodness can be left at the by, by the wayside. You can miss this. You can somehow get a lopsided view of God and miss this part. Let's not forget, God is going to put his anger away. But he's never going to put his kindness away. He's never going to have to do that. See, so this is one of the things that helps us to maintain a, a proper view of the living God, to see him as he is. In the ages to come, his intent toward those that are saved is to lavish his kindness on them. Those who have believed and trusted in his son, that's going to happen. Those are things to come. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. And Brother, Brother Given, I was thinking about you on this one. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 he says, our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change, change our vile body. Yeah, right. mm. so we got a lot of trouble from the body. In fact, 99.9% .9 of your trouble is from your body, because if you had a holy body, you wouldn't be having trouble with the devil. Right. But he's got something not in our hearts. It's not in our heart. we got a new heart, but in our body, we got this trouble that we have to face every day. But you won't always have to face that. Mm -hmm. You may be burdened at times when you will to do good, evil is present with you. You have to lament like the Apostle Paul, wretched man that I am. But you won't always lament that. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have ambitions toward the Lord that are, res 
that you find restrictions on those things because of bodily impairments, even just physical bodily impairments. But it won't always be that way. It won't always be that way. One day you'll have a body that's like unto his glorious body. Amen. And so, brother, and you don't want to faint while you're in this body. Amen. You don't want to faint because we do have another body coming. That, that's going to happen. It's not might happen. It's going to happen. Or how about this one in Psalm 73? You remember when uh, Asaph was so burdened over the advancements of the wicked. I mean, they could easily cast off the righteous, use them for their own purposes, even in a sense scoff about it thinking they're getting away with all these things. And it was a, a painful thing for Asaph, of course, until he went into the sanctuary. And you remember what he saw? That's right. He saw things as they shall be. Yeah. That's what we saw this morning, until he, he saw their end. Mm -hmm. He said, the Lord has set them in slippery places. Mm -hmm. He is bringing down the wicked. Mm -hmm. So, brother, you can't be overly concerned by the Herods that are out there, the wicked man. Seemed like he could never be deposed, and in one day, he's gone. It's like a small example of what God's, gonna, what God's intention is toward the wicked. This doesn't make us vengeful against particular people or things like this, but this does tell us vengeance is his. He will repay. See, you don't have to be overly concerned by the wicked. They are not in control of things in this world. This still is our Father's world. And when you see things as they shall be, it helps you to recognize this. So this and many more things are very critical. What is the value? Let's go beyond. What is the value of this, of seeing things as they shall be? Well, for one, helps us to see, as Brother Michael has said, that God is still the governor among the nations. Remember when Elisha's down in Dothan and a king is pursuing after him and sends this great army after him and surrounds the city. His servant gets up that morning, goes out to sea, and all the servant sees is an army against him. And that's all the world's going to show you. You remember when, uh, who was it, Isaac that said this? Or Jacob. Say, all these things be against me. But there was one that was for him. He just had, he couldn't see that. But when that servant went back to Elisha, Elisha wasn't unsettled, was he? Now we know why some people are not unsettled and why some people are. Some people, all they can see is everything that's against them. Show him. He has for his eyes to be open. That's what good preaching does. And right around that army was those that were greater than they. Remember that's what he said? That's what this kind of preaching does for us. Brother, you want for your preaching to communicate this. They that are with us are greater than they that be with them. And this kind of preaching assists us to do that. Another thing it helps us to do, it helps our mind to be kept from the defiling influence of what is against our hope. Take Abraham as your example. Abraham, against hope, believed in hope. Amen. That's right. If Abraham had made assessments based on how things were, he would never have come to the conclusion that God was going to fulfill his promise and be faithful. Mm -hmm. But that's not what he was looking to. He was looking to things as they shall be. He knew that God had intended to bless the world, to extend his seed through him, and it actually kept his mind so he could think appropriately while he was in the midst of trouble and trial. That's very important to us, brethren, to have that. Another thing, another thing that's so valuable about seeing things as they shall be, it helps our minds to assist us with strength rather than our minds be a source of weakness and bleeding of strength. So your mind can bleed off strength based on what you're thinking about. You remember we have this exhortation in Hebrews chapter 11, this wonderful text of scripture that talks about Jesus. For the joy that set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, Sat down at the right hand of God, then he gives you an exhortation. Consider him, lest ye be weary and faint in your own minds. That doesn't only mean, well, in my mind, I'm just going to quit. That's not all that means. It means your mind is assisting your fainting. That's what it's doing. Your mind is actually causing the fainting because of what you're thinking about. And thus you end up actually saying, well, I'm quitting. You've got to be careful the direction in which your mind goes and what you emphasize because it can either bleed strength or it can give strength. And it's never justified to give yourself consistently to things that bleed strength away. You don't want to do that. So let's take Jesus as an example. Let's think things that, that strengthen our mind. We're going we're gonna to set our minds on the, on the joy that's set before us and we're going to endure. 
A couple more things and I'm done. It helps us to endure the time of temptation by seeing him that is invisible like Moses. What if Moses had just looked at what was all around him? The glory of Egypt. As it was pulling on him and drawing on him. You know, it certainly didn't seem evident that God's intention was to bless Israel. It looked like Egypt had the upper hand in the time when Moses had to make the decision to serve God rather than be in Egypt. They weren't in Canaan when he had to make that decision. And you're not in Canaan, you've got to make the decision. You've got to make it here while you're in Egypt. Amen. How was Moses able to do that? By seeing him that is invisible. See, he saw more than Israel saw. Israel saw serpents. Israel saw judgments. Israel saw fire. Moses saw something beyond that. He saw the God that was leading them into the land that flows with milk and honey, and that's why he asked for him to show him his glory. You live in a time of famine when God has stricken the nations. You've got to be able to see beyond that. You've got to be able to see the God of glory and his great intention for the, for the creation of the world in the first place. He intends to bless all the families of the world. You've got to be able to see that. And it strengthens you like it does Moses. See, because you're under the temptations of the wicked ones every day. We have to overcome that. The point really basically comes down to this, brother, and you're going to be as stable as what you're looking at. If we look at things that are always changing or have the potential to change, we should not be surprised that we're going to be unstable. Haven't you found it to be so? Every time my attention has been drawn away from things that can change, I actually end up becoming as unstable as what I'm looking at. When we proclaim things as they shall be, and these are things that don't change, this is how God strengthens and settles your heart through Christ Jesus, who does not change. So, brother, that's the exhortation. Let's give ourselves to such things. It doesn't mean we don't ignore the present. It doesn't mean we don't ignore things that do change because we talk about Babylon and these other things, but we're not going to emphasize anything that change. We're going to emphasize what doesn't change, and that's what strengthens us. Your comments, brethren, this morning?